Relatively new scientific evidence regarding the neurobiology of trauma has given researchers the ability to provide law enforcement, prosecutors, and advocates with explanations for previously misunderstood victim behavior. We've called this practice wisdom for decades because practitioners who got it knew what they were seeing, and now we have the science to back it up. When learning about trauma reactions and characteristics, understanding neurobiology is important. This video will address two questions. What is the brain doing, also known as symptoms of trauma? And what should I be doing, also known as best practices? Sexual assault is a traumatic, life-threatening experience. The victim's body and brain are flooded with hormones, activating survival strategies such as fight, flight, freeze, or appease. When in survival mode, and when survival instincts are triggered in the days, months, and even years after an assault, a person may act or behave in surprising ways. But if you can view those behaviors as responses to a traumatic event, they start to make more sense. So it's important for the variety of professionals who work with sexual assault victims to understand the neurobiology of trauma. It's a common explanation for why sexual assault victims don't have consistent, holistic stories. There's an initial experience of trauma which overwhelms us, and then there are trauma triggers, which from our perspective observing somebody, um, don't make sense. I was speaking with this victim regarding the sexual assault, and one of the things that came up that seemed a little bit off to me was that when we were actually discussing the specifics of the sexual assault itself, she began laughing. When we think about what trauma looks like when someone has emotional trauma or psychological trauma, we often don't quite respond as well, and we often don't quite understand what we're seeing when we see it. You should understand that a wide range of emotions and victim responses are normal after a sexual assault, including anger, grief, shock, confusion, or trying to maintain control. Survivors may be emotional or matter-of-fact. Avoid making judgments regarding the survivor's credibility based on their emotional or lack of emotional response. In addition, be aware that traumatized individuals often make inconsistent statements. This is a normal reaction to trauma and does not mean a person is intentionally lying or trying to mislead. One suspect took the victim into the back room uh, and brutally sexually assaulted her, and I got called to the scene. And when I'm speaking to this victim, she talked to me just the way that I'm talking to you now. And I didn't understand that. I didn't understand how she was just matter of fact in the way that she trotted through things and why there were certain parts of her uh, account that she wasn't able to recall because this just happened 30 minutes ago, an hour ago. Why? I don't understand that. A victim who reports a sexual assault immediately is likely operating in survival mode, even if they seem calm or are able to talk about what happened. Evaluate survivor statements made immediately after an assault through a neurobiological lens. That is, understand that gaps in memory are a normal response to trauma. When taking an initial statement, the primary focus should be on gathering enough information to determine if a crime occurred and if evidence needs to be collected from a crime scene. I have had many conversations with clients where they're describing to me classic symptoms of trauma. Um, fragmented memories, um, not being able to put things in a timeline, in an order that makes sense to them, um, forgetting things, like just forgetting things in the moment. I've learned in law enforcement that, that who, what, where, and when, and why, that's a very chronologically based uh, interview. And when somebody has been through a traumatic event, it's just not gonna flow out that way. Research provides concrete guidance for interviewing someone who has experienced trauma. First, effective interviewers listen, use open-ended questions, and avoid rapid-fire questions. Second, effective interviewers understand that survivors' brains may connect more easily to sensory information. To prompt memory recall, prioritize questions regarding what the victim remembers hearing, tasting, touching, seeing, and smelling over who, what, when, and where questions. And so to ask them, as many prosecutors do, what happened? Then what happened? 
and what happened next. That's just not a good way for a victim to be able to fully recount what happened to them. We need to ask them more broadly to tell us of their experiences and to tell us how they experienced through those senses. What did they smell, feel, touch, hear during the time they were being assaulted? So for example, if you were to ask them, what do you remember smelling? Or what, do you, what sounds did you hear? What other things did you see? What did you feel from a tactile perspective? May actually trigger a memory. And so if you engage in or encourage the victim to remember their sensory feelings, that could be an inroad into recalling the specific facts of the event. Fear activates our nervous system, sends adrenaline through the body, and that has effects on us. Um, so it does things like um, slow down our long-term memory and make us really focus on in-the-moment, short-term survival thinking. But our prefrontal cortex, like a computer, cannot handle emotive content, meaning it can't process that. And trauma is an emotional content. The other part of our brain is the amygdala that's in the back of our brain and is actually designed to handle emotive content, the trauma part of it. It's able to trigger um, uh, our fear circuitry, which is gonna be part of this multi-systemic response. What the fear circuitry is gonna do is basically the amygdala, if it does perceive and says, yes, this is a threat, is gonna focus the higher level, the prefrontal cortex on that threat. It's almost as if we have blinders on because what our body wants to do, what our brain wants to do is survive this trauma. So for example, if you're asking the victim, who, what kind of witnesses may have been around, and the victim says, I don't know, or the victim reports there were witnesses when in fact there were, it could mean that not that she's lying about it, simply she was not aware about it at the time. Research shows that victims are unlikely to be able to recount the sexual assault in a clear chronological manner, especially soon after the assault. In situations where the victim reports immediately after the assault, take the preliminary report right away, but allow the victim two sleep cycles before conducting an in-depth interview. Research indicates that sleep is vital to improved brain function after trauma. Science has told us that if a victim is able to have 48 hours, two sleep cycles, um, they tend to be able to recall more details after they've been involved in a traumatic event. And so we've seen that with officers and with soldiers, so we apply the same principle here. When an initial case comes in, uh, we don't schedule a victim for a formal interview until at least 48 hours after it's occurred. It's very important to just give them time to process what happened to them, to allow their mind to rest and recharge, and maybe some more of those details will return to them that might not be there immediately following the assault itself. When it is time for the interview, allow survivors to provide the account in their own words and at their own pace. Wait to ask questions to avoid interrupting the flow of the survivor's statement. Ask clarifying questions afterward and explain why you're asking them. In working with victims of sexual assault, you definitely are going to see the effects of trauma. When I see interviews with victims that the detectives conduct, I think it's more productive for them to allow the victim to follow whatever pattern of narrative they have and then later on come and clarify and piece the different parts together. There may be gaps in her story and if you press them on it like we often want to do because the criminal justice system wants these facts is you may actually be encouraging the victim unconsciously to be embedding facts that are actually not true into those storylines. Don't push the victim on facts, particularly right after the event when she could still be experiencing this traumatic response. If a survivor feels pressured to remember, the survivor's brain may attempt to fill in the gaps based on contextual clues instead of actual memory. Without pressuring, encourage survivors to share new memories or pieces of memories as they are remembered. Explain to the survivor why they might not have a full memory of the event due to the effects of trauma on the brain. While sleep and time may help memories consolidate, a full and complete recounting of the event may never occur. 
because a lot of times they'll be apologizing, right? I'm so sorry, I can't remember more. I'm so sorry that I keep forgetting this. I don't know why I don't remember that. You can take a break and say, so let me tell you about what happens when you've been in a traumatic situation. There's been lots of work done on this, and they've seen that if you have been in a traumatic incident, a traumatic experience, your brain processes it differently, it stores it in a different place, and being able to retrieve that information is gonna be hard. You don't ever expect yourself to become a victim of sexual assault. That's not something you ever plan for. You never plan for how you're going to react to that. So you freeze and you're not able to respond. And that's 100% normal. Some of them say, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. Her words were, I do kickboxing. Why didn't I kick him? Why didn't I fight him? I wanted to fight him, but all I was able to think is, oh my gosh, he's going to kill me. We call this um, tonic immobility, and this could be, for example, muscle paralysis. So instead of the muscles then being able to fight or to flee, it actually, the victim may report, I couldn't do anything. My muscles were just frozen. I wasn't even able to make my body um, say no or to fight the particular attacker. Another aspect of this tonic immobility is inhibited vocalization. You implied consent, you didn't say no. It could be the victim was unable to say no because a neurosymphony of hormones that were coursing through their body. Use an expert witness to testify about the neurobiology of trauma to indicate that the inability to fight back may actually be because of the experience of extreme fear. Anytime somebody is placed in a very traumatic situation, uh, it manifests itself in various different ways and everybody is unique. Ask the survivor about post-traumatic symptoms they may be experiencing, such as hypervigilance, avoidance of particular people or places, startle response, trouble sleeping, social withdrawal, depression, anxiety, and drug or alcohol use to cope with the trauma. Survivors may also experience physical reactions such as nausea, flashbacks, and trembling. Educate survivors that these are normal symptoms of trauma and offer a referral to medical and mental health services for further evaluation and support. Then document any symptoms of trauma that the survivor describes. We often think this person is crazy or you know, this person's got a mental illness, when really what we're looking at is trauma. And if we had different information, we might be able to offer them more help. Anybody who walks in your door and says that they have been sexually assaulted needs to be listened to. And every single remedy that you can find for them, you need to just beat the bushes and find. Because the smallest thing can make them feel some sense of vindication and some sense of uh, freedom from what's happened. Over the last decade, there have been tremendous leaps in knowledge about the neuroscience of trauma and the effects of trauma on the brain. The findings of that empirical research now informs policing and prosecution practices today. To learn more, collaborate, and support our research, visit our website at sites.utexas.edu forward slash IDVSA.